And also another very important thing is um, it's, it's because if you think about it, the Manchurians were not really Chinese at that point in time. So the reason why their legitimacy uh, to rule China was because they were willing to embrace Confucianism, the way that the Mongolian in the Yuan dynasty, like uh, from uh, 1278 to uh, uh, 1367, that's why it's a lot shorter, the dynasty, they weren't willing to embrace it like f fully. So if the Manchurians were to get out of Confucianism, that would actually lower their legitimacy, which is actually the, actually the direct cause of the fall of the uh, Qing dynasty in 1911 was when they abolished the examinations in 1905, which I'll come to in the next few times. But Gong had a very simple thing. Gong, when Warren said, you know, it's really, not about, it's really not about things, it's really about philosophy and morality, Gong just said to him uh, very coldly uh, in, in, a, in a, like a minister meeting, no problem. Next time when the British and the French invade again, why don't you go in front of the cannons and guns and why don't you let, talk to them about Confucianism? If you're willing to do that, fine, I won't do anything. Now obviously Warren was like, no. So, so, um, so, so, so in some sense, the, the modernization period began. And then, so we will go from um, point by point in terms of, because this is a little bit different from my other talks where I do it more chronologically. This one's by topic because most things happen simultaneously. But if you look at the first section, it's really, you think, if you think of the modernization process, it's really, they learn what, they see one thing that is good, and so they learn it, and they realize that's not enough, so they learn more, they learn more, they learn more. So the first thing that they saw in the West was that the military, the artillery is better. So the beginning, the, it's, it's China doesn't really have to learn about anything else. It's, it's somehow, for whatever reason, the Europeans had better artillery. So just learn that. So if you look at the first one was Anqing, the, 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 uh, like an arsenal, like a, like a military factory. And Anqing was the, was the doorway to Nanjing. Anqing was the doorway to Nanjing, which was the capital of the Taiping Rebellion. So when, when Zhang took uh, Anqing, he then, you know, he, he, he then saw um, Western artillery being powerful. So he created his own uh, military factory. And the second one is Jiangnan uh, And uh, so that is actually a shipping and also artillery uh, man uh, uh, manufacturing uh, in Shanghai that was founded by Li Hongzhang uh, at Li in, uh, in uh, 1862. This still exists. The, the, the um, aircraft carrier that China created itself by, 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 by herself is actually in this, uh, in this factory. It's, it still exists. But then at that point in time, you know, they try to build their, they try to, you know, try to manufacture their own rivals, rifles, and then they realize that, you know, with corruption and all, and, and all that kind of stuff, A, it, it didn't really work, and B, each, each one costs about 17 tails of silver, but if you buy it from the Germans, it's 10. And mostly because, you know, like everything else that is, you know, Chinese, it's, we've got the best DNA inside, and that is corruption. And so, for example, there were about 70, like in, in the 1870s, this, this company has about 40 officials. In 10 years' time, we had 80. So it's like, you know, a lot of people, a lot of, you know, Mao Tai drinking, you know, <laughs> using the factory's money. And then you look at these words in Chinese, it's ju. Ju means, like, govern office. So like, like, I think like all the other, you know, we look at uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher and uh, like nationalized, like, like privatization and all that kind of stuff. When you have national companies, they're usually inefficient, be it Chinese or European or American. And then also in 1866, uh, General Cho uh, created, a, um, created the, uh, the first shipping uh, uh, shipyard in, in Fujian. So obviously Fujian is right, right facing to, um, to Taiwan, so it made a lot of sense to build. And, and, and General Cho at the time was the, um, was the governor of Fujian and also Zhejiang, so uh, these two provinces. And so he um, created this um, shipping uh, shipyard and also, um, and, and also, um, and also shipping sc like sc school to learn how to make ships and also uh, manufacture ships and also how to dr uh, drive. And we'll get on to that because that school, the, the students there would be the main, would be the first generation of the uh, Navy officers. So, so these are the, so you look, at, you look at it, so it's like, okay, we need to, you need to learn about their, their, their artillery. And the, the artillery is on the ships. That's why we have to learn how to build ships. And so then realize that they need people. And so the next section is about um, uh, educating people in foreign, in, in foreign affairs. So before that, you need to learn 
foreign languages. So this first, uh, this, this first entity is called Tongwenguan, which just means la la like languages, like with other languages. Uh, that's, that was actually one of the biggest debates between Prince Gong and uh, Warren. This Warren is like, we should not, we cannot, like learning other people's languages is like the, it's like the biggest insult possible. And, and actually, but, and then Cixi actually had a, quite a bit of a sense of humor. Uh, in this foreign language um, school, she put in a Chinese studies, like a Confucian studies department, and she put Warren to go. Warren's Mongolian, by the way, and what, what are Mongolians good, good at? Riding horse, horse, horseback riding, right? Warren was, he was, it was, he despised the for, the, this foreign um, school so much, he actually fell from the horse. So it's, it's, like a, it's, like a, it's like an obvious complaint to Cixi, because Mongolian women can have kids on, on horses, right? So, so he fell from the horse, and so, um, so he broke his leg, and he didn't go to, he didn't go to school. This foreign, um, school uh, this foreign languages school subsequently was, was part of um, the Beijing University. So Peking, the, the foreign language department of Peking University, uh, this, is, this is the uh, former uh, uh, entity. And uh, at the point in time, Li was actually the governor in the Jiangsu area, like where Shanghai was. And so he created his own foreign languages um, uh, school. Uh, but he was a lot smarter. He called it the Guangfang Yanguan. So rather than saying the learning of other languages, it's learning other dialects. So, so English and French and German or whatever, it's just another dialect. Of Chinese. Of Chinese. So it's like, a, like so it's Fang Yan. And so, and he, he, and he hired a lot of um, foreigners. So one of, one of them, one of them is a, it's, it's a British gentleman called uh, John Fryer. He, um, he, it's really interesting. He hired him. He was, he came from a poor, uh, like, uh, pastoral family in, in, in England. And then he came and then so hired him and then told, and, and then the Chinese said, you know, make us a steam engine. And I was like, but I'm not an engineer. And for, for the Chinese, it was like, it's so weird. It's like, but you're British, like you're foreign. How can you not know how to make steam engines? Like, the, uh, isn't that like the only thing you know how to do? And so he had to learn, actually, so he, he, he had to actually learn science in order to do translations. But he is actually, and, and so within the 10 years from uh, 1871 to 1880, that, that entity, the Guangfang Yanguang, uh, translated 98 types of books, uh, uh, 235 texts, and mostly science. And so all the Chinese words for like calcium, potassium, sodium, all of these words, uh, uh, mostly from John Fryer. So he learned, he, he learned Chinese and chemistry at the same time. And, and he, he actually created chemistry in Chinese. So he created those characters. He created those characters. So the, the periodic table. Yeah, for a periodic table. He basically, yeah, it's mostly from him, uh, John Fryer. He then left um, China and... Um, and uh, in one of the California State uh, Universities created a Chinese, um, like a foreign, uh, like an oriental language school. And then he went back to, and then he used all his money and created the, uh, basically now the, uh, the, uh, the school for the deaf in Shanghai. So it's, it's, from, it's from him. And uh, so, so that's, um, so that's uh, John Fryer. He, um, there's also, um, the, uh, they also they created a, a foreign customs office to, for, for the customs tax. And the and the um, and Lee actually used a guy called Hart, H A R T, also from also from Northern Ireland. And what's interesting is the customs department in, in, in the Lei Qing were all foreigners. There's not a single Chinese soul, because you can't really trust the Chinese with that much money. And so and so what's interesting is towards the end of the Qing Dynasty, a third of all the taxes came from this customs office in Shanghai, from Hart. And all everybody, if you think about it, a third of the government revenue came from an office that was comprised completely of Europeans and Americans. And then, and then another thing was, um, another big topic was to learn more about uh, you know, Western technologies is sending kids to America to study. And the person who did that was a guy called Yong Hong. Uh, uh, Rong, uh, uh, Yong Hong is a, a, a poor kid from um, Zhongshan. Zhongshan, actually, if you think about it, it's a very important place. That is the, that, that is the uh, home of Sun Zhongshan. And it's not random. You look, if I tell you a few other guys, they're all from there. And partly it's because it's right next to Macau. And so a guy, Yong Hong, he, he, was, uh, he went to a, a, school, a school called Morrison. It was like by uh, foreign uh, missionaries. And he was then um, sent to America to study. So he was the first American um, university student. And he went to Yale. And after Yale, he went back to China. And he helped Zhang Guofan 
to um, buy artillery from America. And so he became friends with Zhang. And so he told Zhang, Zhang obviously was the guy who put down the Taiping Rebellion, and so he was very influential. And Yong Hong was telling Zhang that it's, it's important to send kids to America to study. So in 1872, they did. Uh, they got that approval. Big group, right? That big group, uh, 120. But actually, nobody wanted to go. So actually, everybody who went was actually low. A, a, because if you go, that means you can't really take the public examination. That is the only way to get, up, get ahead in life. And B, you go to America, Americans would eat you alive. That's what most people would, would think. So, yeah, that's, you know, and, and they didn't know about the gun control thing either. <laughs> so, so, so uh, the Second Amendment. So, did they have that by, by then? I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, what happened was, actually, most people did not want to go. But, and most people went, actually, from the coastal regions. I'll tell you one story. This one guy. Um, so, he, he was in the coastal region. And, he, and, and, he was, and then someone asked, uh, approached if he would send his son to go. And he didn't really want to. But, but that guy really wanted his son to marry his friend's daughter. His friend's uh, last name is Tam. And so to, uh, to, uh, and, but then he didn't really have enough cash to, you know, in, in Chinese, uh, it's like the reverse dowry way when you marry uh, a, um, like when you marry, it's the guy's family have to, to pay. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's, yeah, it's horrible. Anyway, so he, he actually didn't have, he didn't want to pay that much to Tam. And he really liked Tam's uh, daughter. And so Tam guy was, because he, he was, He'd been to Hong Kong and then saw Macau, so he knew that this is a really good opportunity. So I was like, you know what? I would let my daughter marry your son, but you have to send him to this America, like to study in America. And then, by the way, I'll give you a discount on the, uh, on the, uh, on the payment to, for, for my daughter. And so the guy uh, did. And that guy then said his son is Zhang Tianyong. He, he's the father of ch railroads in China. He built most of the main railroads in China. So you think about it. The railroads in China, it's like the most fun thing now, and, and, and the, uh, how it happened was absolutely random. It was just because his dad wants to skim on the, uh, <laughs> the groom's money, right? And, and so th they, they went, and, then, and so they went in 1872. Um, it's, it's actually, it's, it, one of the guys called Li Yunfu, uh, like, recalled that that day when he left, his mom was, um, uh, was crying. Because I, in some sense, it's like as if he would never, she would never see her son, and then, and then he said, like, because obviously by the time he wrote the memoir, he had studied in the States, he was like, as Chinese people, we don't really hug. So I gave my mom um, a four kowtows, and then my mom gave me some money and told me to write more uh, letters to home, and then they left. And then when they left, they first went to um, a high school in Connecticut. And then when to Connecticut, they learned English and, uh, and, and also, but, but one thing they did was um, they, they, want, they, they would try to hide their cues, because when they go to the States, People saw them, and then they were like with the cues. So it's like the Americans were like Chinese girl, Chinese girl, like that. So I got that back in Princeton too. But, yeah. but that's another reason. And then, uh, but and, and then and then um, I studied and also did did, did it sports. So of the 120 people, um, subsequently 22 went to Yale, eight went to MIT, three went to Columbia, and one went to Harvard. So in thing like, like it's. Like today. Like, it was like, like Asian, like, and, and there was no affirmative action against Chinese guys too, right? <laughs> so, so, so actually, think about it, it's over. I don't know what the acceptance rate was back in uh, back in those days, but uh, there, there, there was. I mean, I, I even up until like the nineteen sixties. I mean, they were. It was clearly those were legacy schools, like you know. Yeah, the yeah. Best way to get in is if your parents went there. Yeah, but but I think but these guys, their parents obviously did not go. But so yeah. those guys was pretty. So in like they pretty very much overrepresented in. Uh, in like the top IVs and yeah, yeah. And so they, they, they studied and they, um, they also uh, got into sports. So the Yale rowing team apparently, you know, because I read most of this in Chinese, they're mostly Chinese in the rowing team. But obviously I think the, I, I'm sure the American accounts would be slightly different, but you know. And, uh, but uh, you, look at, you listen to every single Chinese uh, modernization process, there's always a but. And there's, what happened was that when they went and they, they studied, they learned the American way of life, and so on and so forth. They, um, they, this person that supervised them, a guy called Chen Lanbin. Chen Lanbin, super, not only did, did he supervise them, they, they also had to, uh, they, the, the kids also had to learn Confucian texts after school. And obviously, if you've been studying like Shakespeare or Aristotle or, or, or Socrates or whatever, you would, not, you would find um, uh, you know, Confucian stuff to be uh, relatively backward. And, and not, not only that, they had also had to kneel towards the emperor and, and, and Confucius every day. And so, so obviously, it was a huge clash in culture. And so 
they, 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 they didn't want to do it. And a lot of them cut, cut off their queues, which was, um, it was like a huge thing. And so Chen Nanbin was actually complaining to Li. Uh, Zhang Guofan was dead, uh, that died at, at, at that time already. Li was pretty much the top of the, of the, of, of the open-minded um, uh, officials that uh, these guys are learning not that they're, they're learning more than just how to make steam engines and, and technology. A, they're not going to like technical schools, they're going to places like Yale, which, so this is probably the only case in history where uh, they, they, like someone has a problem with you, know, you getting into Yale. So, like, so it's like, it's going to, they're going to general colleges, they're learning the American way of life, they've been playing something called baseball and rowing and like stuff like this. And so this is bad, this is like really bad news. They're being corrupted. They're being corrupted. And so Li, and because the original plan was to go for 15 years. But so by 1881, they realized that this is, like, like the, it's not, it can't go on anymore. Li didn't really have such a big problem with learning the American way of life, even though he himself did not really believe, he, he had, he had he, like any, all the first generation modernized, uh, modernizing officials, they believed in Western technology, but Chinese system. The Confucian system is still good, but for some really weird reason, the Europeans came up with these technologies. So you have to learn those, but don't learn how the foreigners think. Just learn how, what they do. So he, he had a problem with them going to Yale. And, he, and Li versus Zhang, and we'll talk about this in, a, in another case, in a, like a foreign um, affair case. This, Zhang is a very tough-minded guy. He's from Hunan. You no, know, Chairman Mao is from Hunan. You know, they, like, uh, the founder of the PLA is from Hunan. Like, these are tough guys. And Zhang, um, his famous line was that, if you punch me and I, and, and I be, and break my tooth, I'll swallow the tooth with the blood. And this, this is his this is famous line. So he's a very tough-minded guy. Li is from Anhui, and Li is more of a, you can't say, he's not soft, he's like more flexible um, politically. So they, they, they have this line called, um, uh, if you learn how to be a human being, be like Zhang, if you learn how to do things, be like General Cho. If you learn how to be a bureaucrat, learn from Li. And so Li didn't really go head on with the opinion that these guys are being corrupted. So it was like, okay, fine, then have them back. And so because it was supposed to be for 15 years, so in nine years' time, a lot of them actually were still studying in Yale. They were, they were actually asked to be recalled. 